Okay, welcome everybody. Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Can Israel's Never-Ending Election Cycle Be Halted? With Israelis heading to the polls for the fifth time in less than four years, what can stop the seemingly endless cycle of elections? Today, we are joined by the Israel um, Democracy Institute's president, Yochanan Plesner, in conversation with an IDI expert, Dr. Asaf Shapira, director of political reform programs, and Dr. Um, Shen, sorry, Friedberg, research um, fellow political reform programs, as they analyze the current state of the November election and present relatively simple reforms that can bring much needed stability to the Israeli political system. We will have a chance to hear from each of them and then have time at the ends for questions and answers towards the end of the program. So please send in your questions on the chat or by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we hope to get it to as many as possible. And now I'm happy to introduce Yochanan Plesner, President of Israel Democracy Institute, to get us started today. Thank you, Yochanan. Thank you, Tamar, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to I uh, conduct this conversation, this time from uh, IDI's uh, uh, roundtable forum. Actually, uh, until now, since COVID began, uh, we had all our conversations on Zoom, but uh, we uh, 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 learned some lessons and now we upgraded our capability to uh, converse and, and use those uh, wonderful uh, digital capabilities. So I'm glad we can now uh, begin this conversation in this new venue. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, kindly mentioned Tamal, uh, I'm joined here uh, by uh, two of uh, IDI's uh, uh, leading experts on Israel's uh, uh, political uh, structures. Uh, uh, Dr. Asaf Shapira heads uh, IDI's uh, uh, political reform program, and uh, Dr. Chen Friedberg, uh, who's uh, probably the, the, the country's leading expert on the Knesset, Israel's parliament, as an institution. So before we jump in both to the structural, to understand, to better understand the structural aspects of the political crisis, and also uh, to, to get a snapshot of where we are, uh, both substantively and politically, uh, on the issues uh, and on the politics, uh, I'd like to have a better introduction with uh, uh, Khen and Asaf. I know them pretty well, but uh, it's an opportunity for uh, uh, for you to get to know them as, as well. So, uh, Ren, how long have you been to IDI? What is your uh, what are your primary areas of focus and so on? Hello, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so, as Yochanan mentioned, I'm uh, Dr. Ken Friedberg. Uh, I'm uh, in the IDI for over thirteen or fourteen years. Um, my uh, I, I'm also. Um, um, lecturer, senior lecturer in uh, Ariel University, uh, and my uh, expertise or areas of expertise are uh, political, the political system in Israel, especially the Knesset, its function or its malfunction, um, uh, women representation, um, uh, election, the election system, uh, and so on. So basically looking at the Knesset, the parliament as an institution, and to try to understand based on comparative research, uh, to diagnose the, the challenges and also obviously what can be changed and fixed and you have a long track record with right. the, doing those things and and, uh, and Chen, the biggest secret is that as a youngster you were also a swimmer in my swim team sure. <laughs> and, uh, and we ended up meeting here at IDI as well. Uh, Dr. Asaf uh, Shapira, so uh, what is IDI's political reform program? Why is it uh, required and in, uh, in, um, sort of Introduce it to us. Well, first of all, I want to say that I joined the, the IDI together with Ken in 2009. And about two or three years ago, I became the head of the political reform program. I replaced Professor Gidon Rat, who is the head of the Department of Political Science in the Hebrew University and still a senior fellow at the IDI. And our job was and still is, I think, to, to, to collect a comprehensive information about the Israeli political system in, in a theoretical and comparative uh, perspective and to find solutions for everything that doesn't work in the Israeli political system because many things are working quite well. We are very successful democracy, I think, but there are very serious problems and we are trying to find solutions. So today's goal is to try and shed light on 
on some of those areas that are functioning less well. Obviously, the, the crisis is a demonstration of that, and to try and uh, and and uh, uh, and propose some uh, fixes. And this is actually what we're doing with the uh, the key uh, leaders in Israel's political system. So. Um, uh, but before we dive into the questions of, of the system, obviously we are now in the midst of, a, of Israel's longest uh, 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 political crisis, the longest political crisis in our history. We're heading uh, on November 1st, we're heading towards uh, our fifth election campaign in less than four years. This is obviously a, a, a symptom of, of the deeper uh, crisis, uh, an electoral crisis, a constitutional uh, a crisis, and, uh, and 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 both of them are uh, or, or the, the weaknesses of our both constitutional fabric and our and, and, and the weaknesses of the electoral system are augmented uh, in light of the political crisis. We have a very uh, a, a popular and charismatic leader. He used to be a prime minister, Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu. Now he is a head of the opposition that is also uh, 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 fighting to prove his innocence in a court case. Uh, he's been indicted for severe crimes of, uh, of corruption. And given his popularity and his uh, uh, willingness and desire to uh, 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 fight for his innocence, not only in court, but also in the political system, uh, uh, this to some extent uh, challenges uh, uh, and, and uh, our um, uh, 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 basically the, the entire uh, uh, political system in Israel. So how did we get here? The first election cycle uh, was in the beginning of 2019. Right. We're now 2022. So it was uh, actually took place on April. April, yes. And now we're, uh, so it's uh, just a, a little over three years ago. If we recall then, it was when the attorney general announced that he's about to indict Mr. Netanyahu. And then Mr. Netanyahu decided to call for an early election. The pretext was the recruitment bill, uh, but essentially there were many who said he wants to call for an early election because the attorney general won't be able to indict him uh, during the election. And, and, and indeed it only happened after uh, the first uh, uh, cycle. After the first cycle, when Mr. Netanyahu thought uh, that he will form a government, he um, um, uh, put forward or his uh, representatives a package of legislation that if, if passed together, uh, the implications were pretty much uh, a, a radical constitutional change that in many ways would void Israel's democracy uh, 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 from some of its uh, uh, key features. Basically an idea to concentrate most of the uh, power and authority among the parliamentary political majority and to weaken all other uh, a professional institution. We call it a hollow democracy. Hollow. Yeah, and 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 do you, do you, would it be correct, Ken, in your eyes, if if we compared uh, that? I, I mean, do you have any other sort of democracies oh, that? Well, uh, I don't want to compare us to Turkey or to uh, Hungary, but um, in the worst case scenario, it might go there but uh, i don't want to think that uh, it is in worst case scenario you mean if if some of those initiatives yes. if you have to pick one initiative that is uh, from your vantage point the, the um, most um, disconcerting um on the on the constitutional front um what do you think Asa? maybe expanding the immunity of of yeah. uh, knesset members in order that netanyahu will avoid a criminal trial this this one thing, yeah. So the, the, there was an, an immunity bill. It means that even if you're as an incumbent, you you have, you gain immunity, yeah. Yeah. and for that to uh, to solidify that immunity, there was an attempt to also severely right. undermine the authorities of the Supreme Court because otherwise it would be expected the Supreme Court would uh, uh, overturn yeah. such a decision. So as a collateral damage, also severely undermining uh, uh, the court. At, uh, as a constraining institution in the in the balance of power or or separation of powers that currently characterizes Israeli democracy, so this would be probably the so anyway. So that's uh, we should move on, but that was the sort of main and, and it's still now a main theme of 
of Israeli politics. After the first election, and nobody had a, a majority. After the second election, nobody had a majority. Asaf, the fact that Israel managed to go through uh, two election cycles without a government being formed, is that unique to Israel? The idea that we have an election and in the end, there's no decisive outcome. Yeah, it was the first time that it happened, that no government was formed after the elections. But this is a new problem. I have to say that the political instability in Israel is not a new problem. Well, it became, it has become much more extreme over the past few years, but it is not new. The Knesset is supposed to serve for at least four years. The last time that the Knesset completed its term, it was the Knesset that was elected in 1984. Before any of us had a right to vote. Yes. Yeah, yes. And and um, so so we are in a situation of extreme instability. In terms of a frequency of elections, Israel went from the uh, 15th place up, out of 21 parliamentary democracies before the 2019 elections to being on the last place today among these democracies. On average, since 1996, we are going to elections every less than two and a half years. This is an extreme case of political instability. So so out of 21 parliamentary democracies that we compared Israel to, Israel has the highest frequency of elections, which means the least stable democracy. Yes, exactly. And uh, and obviously since, 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 since 1996. 1996, and it's obviously in political science, we usually look back a, a generation, 25 years. Uh, so, so this is a strong indication. Uh, what are the other indications of, of, of political instability? Well, the duration of, of ministers in their uh, portfolios, in, in, in the offices, is, is become uh, much uh, shorter. I think that uh, we have the data here. The Minister of Finance is serving, on average, one in, in, in three months in his uh, ministry. We, we, he can't... He can't Ministers of Interior. Interior, yeah. He can't promote any serious reforms when, when his duration in his uh, ministry is, is so short. So, and, and it's important to note here that the duration of ministers in office is shorter than the, uh, than the durations of, or the terms of Knesset. So, I mean, Knessets are two and a half years or less, but ministers serve even less because less, there's less high uh, uh, turn, yeah. uh, turnaround between governments, within governments, yeah. and so on. Yeah, within the same Knesset. Yeah. yeah. So, Hen, what, uh, let's not forget something that, yeah. uh, you know, Israel has a parliamentary system. And in parliamentary system, there is uh, built in instability yeah. because, uh, because of the separation of powers is weaker than separation of powers in presidential, presidential yeah. systems. So, uh, the government are derived from the uh, parliament. You know, the people of Israel are electing the Knesset. The Knesset elects the, the, the uh, vote for a new government. Uh, it's not the case in the uh, uh, U.S. where there is fixed terms. Yeah, so you're saying when, when we compare the level, degree of instability in Israel, we compare it to other parliamentary democracies. Right, and not and if we look at it from a, an American vantage point, we should remember that Israel is not a presidential system. You know, there, there are, are few terms. democracies that are presidential systems, right. the US, France, but right. the majority are parliamentary democracies. Right. We think Israel should remain a parliamentary right. democracy. Because There's built in flexibility right. and elasticity exactly. within parliamentary yeah. democracies, and you can but nevertheless- Solve the, de the deadlock. Yeah, yeah but by nevertheless- By new government or going to early elections. So some stability is a good thing, but nevertheless, we think that in Israel's case, we come to extreme. Exactly, because uh, as uh, Asaf indicated, even when we compare ourselves not to the right, US right. case that has an entirely different system, but to other parliamentary democracies, uh, uh, we have many indications that uh, our system is particularly uh, unstable. Now, um, Asaf, so, so there's two elements basically we put on the table with respect to Israel's political system, instability and uh, an indecisive nature. In Hebrew, we call it the, the fact that there's no decision at the end of the election. Um, which of them do you deem or uh, more uh, uh, unique or 
I think that what is more unique is the fact that in Israel we have many ways to dissolve the Knesset, many mechanisms to dissolve the Knesset, more than in any, I wouldn't say, yes, more than in any other parliamentary democracy, I think. Uh, uh, for example, we, um, one, one, one way or one mechanism to dissolve the Knesset is the fact that if the Knesset does not approve the state budget until a specific date, it is automatically dissolved. This is a very rare mechanism from a comparative perspective. It happened only once in the previous government, yeah. the Netanyahu and Gantz uh, government, but the fact or the danger that the Knesset won't approve the state budget and will be dissolved caused instability also in other cases and led to the dissolution of the Knesset. Another very rare mechanism, and it surprises us, uh, uh, it surprises us as Israelis, is the Knesset dissolution law, because as Israelis, it seems to us very natural that the Knesset yeah, can dissolve it's a law of law. nature. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But this is quite a rare mechanism. It exists in Austria, in Croatia, in some other countries with a special majority of 60% or 70% of the members of the parliament, Poland, Lithuania, the Czech Republic, and that's it. So, uh, so I think that, that that's probably a very important point. Few Israelis, by the way, are aware of it. Few Israeli politicians and pundits in the political system. And I think this is something that we noted and in, 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 in the fact that we looked at, oops, at other democracies uh, helped us. The, the unbearable ease of dispersing the Knesset. This is the point, the unbearable ease. Now, uh, Chen, you follow you know, Knesset and Knesset members. How does it affect, do you think, or in your experience also the political behavior, the effectiveness, of the individual member of Knesset and of parties, the fact, the knowledge that it's so easy to dissolve the Knesset? Well, I think um, maybe, I'm not sure, but maybe it, um, uh, not the, the best people are running for office because they know that in a few months or maybe a year top, the Knesset will be dissolved or dispersed, and and they have to uh, find another uh, job, so they won't. Uh, so serious yeah, people yeah, with serious career people options will think twice before yeah. they uh, are entering this uh, arena, because uh, this arena is so unstable and so dangerous. And it means basically that constantly you're constantly trying to get elected, right. trying to look for your uh, future path for re-election. Yeah. And even if the Knesset doesn't dissolve itself, you have to prepare for this scenario. Yeah. So that this means is the main that it's concern. A, exactly. Not, not so 80% uh, of your energy in a good no, day yeah. is around that and not around how to improve Israel's education system, how to improve the health system, yeah. how to deal with the uh, religion. Yeah, state, I, the I, suspect this is the, I suspect this is the case. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, almost 50% of Knesset members are uh, uh, are new each term uh, speaks for itself. Yeah. So basically, also we're we're uh, one of our uh, characteristics or features that characterize Israel's political system in in comparison to other mm -hmm. parliaments is the uh, 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 turn turnaround or turnover. turnover or basically uh, yeah, half of rate of half retirement of, of members. Half of this. Knesset members that uh, uh, now in incumbents in this the twenty fourth Knesset ah. won't be in the twenty fifth Knesset. Wow, half of them. Yeah. So uh, I think. So I, I think also you know if we take you know in politics in a time of populism, um, when Knesset members are constantly fighting for their survival with such a rate of attrition that half don't make it, it creates a very very strong uh, incentive. To look at the short term, to be, loud. to be very loud, to make sure that you gain exposure in, in social networks and so on. I mean, it creates all the wrong incentives rather than let's sit together, let's find a pragmatic compromise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we it, are here for it, four yeah, years. Exactly. We, we have a long term uh, to serve together. Uh, let's find the common denominator. It, it, we almost begin to laugh when I present something that yeah. one would expect a national leadership to think in those terms. But structurally, uh, uh, we found ourselves, I mean, it's not by design. Nobody sat there and said, how do we design the wrong incentives? But de facto, the, those are the wrong incentives. 
Um, Asaf, from from your experience, uh, the what are the prices that we're paying for instability? I mean, say because there's also an upside. You know, if, if I'm looking at it from an American standpoint, uh, sometimes too much stability. If you have, say, uh, in in the American system, a president and uh, uh, and and the House. Uh, or uh, Congress that uh, you know with the majority for the other uh, uh, for the other side it can mean par- paralysis yeah. and and in our in our system there's built instability that is supposed to uh, I would be say built in instability built in flexibility maybe okay. so yes when the government and the Knesset are totally dysfunctional it's better to go to For early elections in a hope that after them a new and more stable government and Knesset will be established but but again also the comparative data in in comparison between Israel today and Israel in the past show us that Israel now is in ex in extreme problem of political instability and Ken mentions the some of so the prices can, can you also expand from your vantage point on you know why should we care okay there's an, an, an election. Well, the, the participation, the, there are so many reasons. The, the wrong incentives for Knesset members, the wrong incentives for ministers to focus on the short term and not, not to promote long term. The, the, the fact that the, the participation of voters, of the citizens in politics might drop. And, and public trust. The public trust in politics, yes. The people critical do, for democracy, a public trust. The people that go for, for politics, yeah. as you said. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm trying to think of, you know, concrete examples. We were very um, motivated to help, you know, in, in, in multiple areas of legislation. One of them lowering the exemption age for ultra-Orthodox men. So those who do not serve to ensure that they no longer have to be captives in their own yeshiva, mm-hmm. uh, just because the law uh, uh, mandated that if they don't serve, they have to... Uh, yeah. be in the yeshiva yeah. and gain uh, state subsidies. So we uh, um, played a very instrumental role in bringing the government to initiate that legislation to lower the exemption age. It passed as a government decision. It passed in the Knesset in a first reading. We pretty much already celebrated this policy then, achievement. Oh. And then and before uh, the final second and third reading, the Knesset dissolved itself. Similarly, Um, um, uh, we, metro law? Yeah, uh, the metro. Uh, uh, metro. So Israel, uh, uh, for those who, uh, of you who visited Israel post-COVID. Um, um, the, uh, we're stuck in some traffic yeah, jam. Yeah, we're, we're uh, stuck in a sort of endless traffic jam. And, uh, and, uh, and the government promoted uh, a metro uh, decision that Re- required many changes in, le- in, in, in legislation in order to enable uh, building an underground in metropolitan Tel Aviv, under, uh, uh, underground uh, a massive public transportation system with an investment of about 180, uh, approximately 180 billion shekels. Uh, but initially it required the legal infrastructure and the government promoted it. And when we reached the sort of final stage, Um, the Knesset dissolved itself and the metro law went into the refrigerator. And in so, uh, and, and perhaps I'll give another example, our education system, its budget has been pretty much doubled over the past decade. Uh, we used to say 80% increase over the past decade, but now there was a recent increase. So I'm saying doubled. pretty much doubled, but the achievements as we measure them of the education system, Uh, at best are stagnant. Um, given the fact that the political system is so short-sighted as opposed to the trade unions that are leading the yeah. education system that are there forever, uh, uh, there's a mismatch. The politicians are there for the short term. At best, they can pour more money, but they cannot demand any structural changes, uh, compensation based on merit, on uh, excellence, and so on. So uh, and, so and, and this is just another example. If we had a stable government, stable political system, a government that has a built-in incentive for politicians to collaborate with one another, uh, they could have taken on those fundamental challenges 
in, in, in transportation, education, health, uh, health uh, security, housing. Housing is a huge, uh, all it is is cement and build and building, but it requires so much, uh, such a concerted effort with so many uh, agencies that, below, that report in so many different uh, ministries that the, the, the final outcome is that the supply of housing uh, uh, is not able to um, uh, um, yeah, ca catch up mm -hmm. the demographic growth. And in this case, uh, uh, prices are basically young Israelis are being priced out of the market and uh, uh, to our detriment. So the political system, uh, uh, the price we're paying for instability it is is tremendous. As Asaf said, uh, for uh, as for education, in the in ten years we had five or six ministers of education. Yeah. So and every minister has a new program, and uh, uh, every minister is coming from a different uh, party. So sometimes from extreme right parties. And from as they enter party. office, so there's a huge turnover yeah. of. Uh, you education can, ministers now they know they, the they are very smart usually politicians are smart and and they they know that the their time in office is extremely limited taking on this monstrous large mm -hmm. institution a 70 more than 70 billion shekel of institution 200,000 uh, teachers yeah. trying to make a structural meaningful change would be irrational yeah. Instead, Impossible. let's uh, announce a few nice programs, yeah. steer up some uh, exactly. identity politi poli politics and some emotions around some issue, and move on to the next position. Put a so, band-aid on a exactly. huge... So, so those are some, some of the prices of, uh, of instability. I'd like to move on in a moment to the remedies. Um, that's, but that's here for exactly, <laughs> because... You know, it's our role also to diagnose because, diag like in uh, 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 my father, who was an architect, used to say, lighting is 90% of architecture. And I heard somebody in medicine that says, uh, uh, diagnosis is 80% of uh, medicine. So I mean, diagnosing the problem and saying, okay, it's about the unbearable ease of uh, dissolving the Knesset. We diagnose that problem. The fact that uh, it, we can have elections without a decisive outcome is another structural problem. A third, we also have problems, but it's not the scope of this discussion, perhaps in future discussions, some inherent weaknesses of the Knesset as an institution and so on. We're not gonna expand on it here, but. I think there are, there are very serious problems that can be uh, successfully uh, managed only after a reasonable, only after we reach a reasonable level of stability. We, are, we have, Ken and myself, many desirable reforms like regional elections or improving the, 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 the Knesset, but we can't promote these reforms. Yeah, as so long currently, as we want to focus on, on, on the smallest uh, fixes or, or the, the uh, 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 most limited scope of policy fixes Gain that can generate the highest uh, impact or um, upside in terms of uh, restoring uh, uh, a stable functioning outcome for the system, which will then allow it both to deal with uh, substantive areas mm -hmm. and, and political reforms, and political reforms, i.e., strengthening, improving uh, our institutions to deal with the uh, 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 challenges of, of, of the 21st century. Now, before we move to those tiny and, and wonderful fixes and to their viability, I feel obligated. We spoke about the, the constitutional instability uh, of Israel and the, and the fact that we are a democracy without a constitution, 61 uh, uh, members of parliament can pretty much decide everything and uh, uh, completely uh, uh, um, the avoid the, the authorities of, of the independent judiciary, uh, uh, change all basic laws. Change all basic laws that grant if we don't have a bill of rights, and so uh, given that uh, uh, level of, I would say, constitutional fragility in a populist age where you know the uh, unheard of is no longer unheard of, 
and unprecedented is no longer unprecedented. Um, I'd like to uh, hear your thought about, there, there are two aspects to a constitution. There's the institutional aspect, and there's the, the, the part that has to do, you know, Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, uh, uh, basic freedoms, and, and so on. I'm, I'm setting aside the, 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 the Bill of Rights aspect, and uh, I would like to ask how reasonable would it be to make institutional arrangements like changing the electoral system and so on, those institutional arrangements that have to do with the fundamentals of our democratic regime if we do not have a constitution? You, you ask how easy it no, would be? Uh, or? Uh, uh, does it make sense to sort of make changes to say our electoral system, given the fact that we have this uh, uh, Un, uh, unstable uh, constitutional. Uh... I don't think we have a choice. I don't think really we have we have a choice if we won't do it. I also think so, but I wanted to hear you say that. Yeah, because we won't <laughs> if we won't do it, there won't be a democracy left to 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 take care to 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 improve. So yeah. it's really crucial in my eyes to 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 do it. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, so so ba basically, given the fact that we do not have a sort of rules of the game that are etched in stone and secured and solidified, um, the way our constitutional arrangements are evolving are chapter by chapter. So, you know, IDI is a strong advocate of ensuring what we call basic law for legislation, right. ensuring that basic laws, i.e. constitutional chapters, have a special rigid procedure. But at the same time, we, we think that we, we do not have the luxury to uh, wait for a fully fledged constitution to, to emerge, educate the people. and, and, so and we in don't the have meantime time. to continue in right. instability, because there's a price also with respect uh -huh. to the trust of the Israeli people in our democratic it's system. Already reduced uh, uh, dramatically. So yeah, the Knesset uh, has uh, uh, how many uh, uh, percentage of trust? Maybe uh, twenty-one yeah. percent. I, I, I'm, I'm not allowed to uh, expose data. Oh, no, it's, from, it's, no, that's no, from it's the 21, 2021 20, yeah, democracy index. But we're already collecting the data for the 2022. So from the and 21, we're going to present it by low. the end of the yeah, year to the so president of the state. The and I can just give you a heads up without any numbers because I'm not allowed to. In previous years, yeah, the, 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 the percentages are very low. The situation is not improving. And we know that public trust is the... Uh, um, a, a belt of defense for democracy. The public needs to feel that this our democracy is delivering the goods. Delivered Otherwise, the goods. Yeah. and we know that there's also a, a growing uh, desire, craving for a quote unquote strong man that right. will disregard the media, the Knesset, yeah. and fix up everything. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, we see that there's a growing desire. And that's why we don't think that, you know, our discussion is some kind of a theoretical discussion about uh, at some point this needs to be fixed, but rather right here and right now. So Asaf, after this extremely <laughs> long buildup, how can we fix the stability aspect? I think that from what we all said so far, it is clear that we must make it much more difficult to dissolve the Knesset. So first, we can uh, eliminate the, the connection between passage or non-passage of the state budget and early elections. And second, we can determine uh, that in order to pass the Knesset dissolution law, a majority of 70 or 80 Knesset members will be required, unlike 61 Knesset members today. We... Now it's a simple majority. Yeah, of so, 61. Yeah, even, yeah. even less. You don't have any need. I think in a third, yeah, in a third hearing, uh, reading it uh, only on a third, yes. Yes. We have another proposal that we, we propose to at least consider seriously, and this is expanding the role of the president of Israel in the process of dissolution of the Knesset. For example, to determine that if the president sees that the Knesset and the government are totally dysfunctional, he or she can initiate a move to dissolve the Knesset, and such a move will, uh, will uh, require a majority of only 61, unlike the Knesset dissolution law, which will require 70 or so, 80 Knesset members. You'll be the responsible adult. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this, this, I want to say this, this is a, all of what I said are very common mechanisms in a comparative perspective. In most other uh, parliamentary democracies, if the parliament is dissolved, 
it is usually the result of initiative of either the head of the state or the prime minister, not the parliament itself. So, so what we're saying is the problem, the unbearable ease of the, of the Knesset dissolving itself, the remedy, the Knesset can no longer dissolve itself. Uh, it can, uh, but it, it yeah, can. Unless uh, two thirds, yeah. well, 80, uh, 80 members, or you know, obviously in a political yeah. negotiation, right. 70, 80, but right. two thirds is a, is a thumb rule. Uh, decide. That means that once a government, there's an election, there's a new government, once this government is sworn in, it pretty much has an insurance policy uh, uh, that, that means that the Knesset, can, it no longer has to sort of uh, chase every individual MK yeah. with a fear that- uh, Exactly, I wouldn't say insurance because again, if the Knesset and the government- Limited insurance. Limited insurance. <laughs> if the Knesset and the government are totally dysfunctional, Probably a majority of 70 or 80 Knesset members it's will found. yeah, will be found, or the, the prime minister will dissolve the Knesset. Or, 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 or the there's president. a mechanism of constructing yeah, exactly, confidence. Yeah, exactly. The Knesset giving confidence exactly. to an alternative government. Yeah. Right. But no single Knesset member or even small party within the coalition can blackmail the, the coalition, the government, and threaten to dissolve the Knesset. This is our goal. Yeah. And um, uh, we're elected. Get along yeah. with them. Exactly. Yeah. The people, we we bother the people hopefully once in four years. You go, you make your choice. Now the politicians figure it out. Yes. That's yeah. the logic. And the and the and the beauty is actually that this is we're not inventing anything, but pretty much in in various uh, um variations, this is the, the norm among parliamentary democracies. Yeah. Again, except for two. We are, the rare case. we are the rare case. We are the rare case, and what we're suggesting is for Israel to sort of... Uh... In, in terms of dissolution of parliament, our reform will make Israel much more similar to other parliamentary democracies, certainly. So before we move to the element of making Israel's elections more decisive, uh, i.e. to ensure that if there was an election, there's also an outcome, i.e. a new government emerges, um, what do you think is the likelihood or uh, what uh, a scenario uh, uh, for such a reform to pass? Good question. <laughs> yeah, good question. And this is actually your job to convince the politicians okay. uh, uh, to support uh, this uh, idea. It's actually good that you are referring <laughs> that. Uh, if because... you ask each MK, if a Knesset member, he will vote for it. Yeah, it's actually, his interest. we've been conducting discussions with many players in the system, members of parliament and uh, uh, people in the, in the media and advisors and, and actually also professionals. And, and I must say that I've never uh, uh, witnessed such support and, and consensus. This issue there has is not this. been politicized yet. So I can't say that there's more support in the center left or in the right. I mean, it, it's an issue that is still not colored with political colors, yes. and, and, and that's the advantage. And, and, and again, beyond stability, what the individual politicians have in mind is job security. Okay. So it's stability for the state, but job security, and you know, if, but, if the interests are aligned, I'm fine with it. Given what happened in the last three years, so uh, if you are uh, looking for a logic in this system, yeah. No, I didn't say that in order to say, well, for sure this is going to happen. But we know that there's a yeah. lot of traction. There's a lot of interest here, right here where we're sitting, the leader of, of probably the third largest party, Benny Gantz, the former chief of staff, sat here and endorsed the key elements of this uh, uh, program. We spoke to people from Likud, Shas, uh, uh, Labour, uh, Lapid's party. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 okay. Lieberman endorsed uh, uh, a version of this uh, 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 finance minister Lieberman, so we think it's 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 gaining traction. Again, I I wouldn't enter into the political scenario of how it would pass, but probably once it passes, it will only pass what we say in Hebrew. I'm not sure it's translated well into English beyond the uh, the the veil of ignorance. Yes. So it will pass in the next Knesset, only to be applied in the Knesset afterwards, sure. because it wouldn't be. We want it to pass in a large majority, both of coalition right. and opposition. If you're in opposition now, yeah. you wouldn't provide an insurance policy to a government. But, but you, you wouldn't, don't know if you would do it be. for the future. Yeah. Yes. I, I also want to say that there are other uh, 
mostly electoral reforms that influence the interest of some parties, especially the, the small parties. They, they force them to unite, to merge, or to run together with the large parties. So small parties like the ultra-orthodox parties, which are strong veto players, oppose such reforms. But this is not the case. This is not the case. This reform does not influence their political interests at the same. Because it provides a remedy to the issue of instability, but not to the fragmentation. Yes. Right. yes. And, uh, and so now let's go to the decide how to ensure that Israel's election creates a decisive outcome. Okay. Today, there is a vote of con. So there's a procedure that we won't enter into. Yes, it's your vote. Yeah. And, uh, and the uh, but ultimately, if the current procedure doesn't produce a government with a majority in the Knesset, the Knesset automatically dissolves itself. And we're now looking at the polls, and it's not inconceivable yeah. that after the fifth election, Netanyahu currently in the polls, if we take the current, uh, Netanyahu and his uh, uh, allies uh, within the ultra-Orthodox and nationalist uh, uh, parties together add up to Around 59. 59. That's yeah. quite According consistent. According to most of the polls, 59. Lapid and his uh, uh, sort of the presumed allies, around 55. Yeah. And there's the six seats for the uh, joint list that uh, Arab, uh, Arab uh, the joint uh, list that represents uh, the Arab minority. And they uh, the declare, the, yeah, that they're on the fence that they're not intending to join any government. Given the current system, we're going to end up in this election, given in the current system of how to form a government. It's not inconceivable, or I would even say it's uh, quite likely, yeah, likely that oh, the likely. outcome of the election will lead to uh, Lapid continuing to serve as interim prime minister of a caretaker government. The procedure will produce no new government. And we will end up uh, uh, um, rolling into election number six. So uh, actually, I have two questions. Number one, can, from a constitutional standpoint, can such a Knesset that didn't even form a government create uh, this uh, legislation of uh, uh, stability, i.e., for the for the following Knesset? Can a Knesset legislate even if it's if it's a Knesset that is uh, that still didn't produce an, a stable government? Yeah, it can, it can legislate, but it's it's hard. It's not a, it's not a common case to legislate when you have a, a, a take a government and the, the Knesset is uh, uh, dissolved itself. So what so. conditions do you think, if we're going to end up in this limbo situation, do you think it would be right? Um, in my view, only if it's a sort of a broad consensus of, say, Likud, the yeah, Shatid, sort of if, if there's a broad consensus of let's change uh, the rules of the game to ensure that at least next time yeah, we there will be a decisive election. Exactly. Uh, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe uh, this would be. It, 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 it wouldn't be right to fix, to change the system uh, in a sort of 61 majority or, or something that is no. in, uh, a divide. And given the divisive nature of our politics, it would make it even more challenging. So, are the challenges over? Now, uh, <laughs> Saf, um, um, so, so given the fact that we've now uh, realized that we might end up without a decisive outcome, um, what is, uh, we're, we're about to publish now a, a, a paper uh, uh, with policy recommendations, uh, with recommendations also to solve this element to ensure a decisive outcome. So what what's the... So, What's so the recommendation? To, so today, in order to form a government, a vote of investiture is required. Yeah. The government must win a simple majority, more supporters than opponents. And for example, in 2019, no government, uh, no government won such a majority. So we had another elections and another election. According to our proposals, after the two first rounds of attempts to form a government, any Knesset member may present a government to the Knesset, and the government that enjoys the largest uh, support in the Knesset, a, a most Knesset votes will be formed. So, for example, if uh, 56 Knesset members uh, support the government proposed by Netanyahu, and 55 Knesset members support the government proposed by Lapid, the government uh, proposed by Netanyahu is formed. Even if this government doesn't have a majority, majority even if it's a minority, yeah. 
of supporters. Exactly. Exactly. To the Knesset, to the political life, the the concept of a minority, of minority government. government. We had some, but it's not the the. So can you look at other parliaments? And minority governments are an acceptable yeah, animal. And the, all the Nordic, which conditions yeah, do they... In the Nordic states, there are a lot of minority governments. This is this is very common. Very right? common. In Denmark, yeah. Norway, Sweden, and Finland, also Spain. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but, you know... Are, it, it's are they effective? To... Do they deliver the goals? Well, yes, because it, uh, um, it fits to their... Uh, political culture so it's or also shapes or maybe it, you know what can, <laughs> which come first i don't know but yeah it it, it fits the, the the political culture uh, shapes it and in israel uh, the concept of minority government uh, that uh, needs to 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 fight for each vote and to uh, ask for the support of the arab uh, parties well, the political culture here is not that. Uh, But perhaps you know we saw that yeah, one of the um, in such a one of the shortcomings of the outgoing government, the Lapid Bennett government, that served for about a year and then collapsed with a 61 versus 59 majority, was the fact that we had a right wing, you know, a few right wing parties, uh, and, and and obviously one of them was Bennett's right wing party, and at the same time an Islamist uh, party. Uh, uh, Arab party having to serve together and identify a common denominator. And it was difficult to digest both for the politicians and for the for both publics. So it was very difficult. This, on the one hand, uh, a new concept, uh, an Arab party joining Israeli coalition politics, normalizing the participation of our Arab uh, a minority in politics, in division, in, in, in allocating right. national resources and so on. So obviously it's, it's, a, it's a positive democratic uh, development. And at the same time, it uh, awakened so many fears on both sides, very difficult for the Jewish majority to digest, very difficult for the Arab minority, many because being in government requires legitimizing, constantly compromising and so on. So it was difficult and obviously it fell apart. How would our, our system uh, will ensure a decisive outcome? And it will also in some probability, hopefully not high probability, create from time to time minority governments. Do you think that creating this option for minority governments will create an option for participation of fringe groups like the uh, Arab parties in a way that will be easier to digest? It might. It might also change the, a bit the political culture. Uh, now it's more, uh, there is more, uh, more legitimacy to uh, Arab uh, party to serve in, in government than it used to be. It, it wasn't, you know, the case until 2019. So, uh, or 2021. 21. Uh, so now it's more, maybe bearable to the Israeli Jewish year to, yeah. to, to, to digest this. Um, but you know, um, time will tell. I'm not sure this will be the case. Maybe it will... Uh, we we don't know. Legitimacy. By the way, it can also create uh, uh, other cooperations, for example, between the ultra-Orthodox parties and centrist parties. You know, it happened under Kadima in 2006 and in Barak in 1999. It, it doesn't happen today anymore, but it can happen according to uh, our I, proposal. I, 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 in my experience, uh, uh, you know, six years in the parliament, both in coalition and opposition, it's a lot easier uh, to engage in ad hoc deal making yeah. on specific legislation, specific yeah. issues, quid pro quo versus now you support this government as a whole and so on. So ideally this will sort of bring in, uh, uh, bring politics back into the Knesset where uh, sort of, if you have political power, you you gain benefits uh, and, 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 and you pay for that by supporting some initiatives. So I think- I, The word I, is ideally, you know. Is it, yeah, I mean, if, 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 uh, if, 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 if we encounter a situation system. like over the past year, where there was, I would call it, scorched earth political, uh, uh, political scorched earth uh, of basically complete delegitimization. So we saw the opposition said, we're not gonna collaborate with anything, even things we agree on and so on. Such an arrangement well, of a minority the, government. The committee work? 
yeah, not allow, not manning the committees and so on. That obviously that arrangement uh, of of a minority government then would fail. But for no, this, but we created that mechanism of a president that if he exactly. sees that in, in a situation of paralysis, he or she can intervene. And, and the assumption is that once the opposition parties know that the Knesset and the government are here to stay, that they are stable, they will be more ready to cooperate with the government. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it's possible. So I found this discussion extremely intriguing and inspiring. I hope it wasn't too detailed and technical for, uh, for, uh, for those of you who joined us. Um, um, but this is trying to make sense uh, uh, of the nitty gritty of the mechanisms that make up uh, Israeli politics and produce the uh, 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 outcomes and unstable outcomes that can be viewed from the outside. Uh, Tamar, uh, uh, can uh, uh, we be glad to sort of uh, uh, take some of the uh, questions, comments, and so on? Thank you so much. And you, Thank you all. You have a way of making very dense and tough information to understand um, a little bit easier to grasp. So thank you for that and to sharing all of this. We now have a little bit more time to take questions from the audience. So please, please write your questions in the Q&A box and I will try to get to as many as possible. But I will get us started. And this is for anybody on the panel to, to get to answer. First question that has come in is, in the past, IDI has proposed that the largest party automatically form the government. Seems like what you're saying now is a little bit different than that. Is this still your recommendation? And is there part of that that you're still recommending? I will start. I think first that the political feasibility of this reform is very low now because of what I said. This reform actually poses small parties to merge with, with the larger parties. So the small parties in the Knesset strongly oppose this reform, like the ultra-Orthodox parties. So this is one reason that this uh, the political feasibility of this uh, reform is low. There is also one more advantage of our reform over this previous reform, uh, according to which the head of the largest party will become the prime minister, because according to our reform, if there is a minority government, it will be the largest largest minority government possible, the minority government that enjoys the largest support in the gov in the in the Knesset, and this is very important. I would uh, uh, probably add that um, I, I, we mentioned before that Israel uh, uh, does not have uh, a institutional uh, arrangements that are constitutionally guaranteed. So we don't have a constitution that defines the different institutions, Knesset, government, uh, judiciary, and, and the division of power uh, between them. Uh, and, and, and given this constitutional uh, uh, fragility, and given what we've seen and experienced over the past uh, uh, few years in terms of violations and, and new laws in terms of uh, political conduct, um, uh, we thought that uh, uh, such an arrangement that has uh, uh, big advantages with respect to dealing with a, a, a problem of uh, fragility and, no, and, and large number of parties and so on, but such an arrangement is probably a, a better passed as part of a, a, a broader constitutional uh, uh, a package that also guarantees that uh, uh, other branches, especially the judiciary, have uh, uh, authorities of uh, supervision over uh, the two other branches. Great, thank you. Another question is, what about regional elections? Does it make sense for all of Israel to remain one district? We strongly support regional elections. We have proposed it for years. I think that you know that Israel is unique in the, in the sense that uh, all of Israel is one large electoral district in which all the 120 members of the Knesset are elected. This is highly exceptional. It harms the representation of the periphery, uh, accountability, uh, responsiveness, and so on. And, and we, we managed to convince, I think, some senior politicians, prominent politicians, to support this idea. Regional elections were included in the official guidelines of the current government. But again, 
the political feasibility of this reform is low because naturally the, the, the media, politicians, uh, the public, and even the Israel Democracy Institute focus more today on political stability. And, and again, such important reforms can be promoted only after a, a reasonable level of, of uh, political stability will be reached. I would also add about regional, I mean, when uh, Asaf mentions regional elections, it's not turning the mm -hmm. country into 120 regions, but relying on the existing uh, a division of Ministry of Interior of about around... Oh, moreover, we are talking about multi-member districts, so not like in the United States. regions that already exist and, and multi-member and, 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 and creating a combination of about roughly half are elected nationally and half in say 20 regions or, or, or 17 regions. Yeah, there, there are different and, models, but we are again, about... I think the, uh, another, beyond the feasibility, when we don't have constitutional instability, when we don't have constitutional stability, even if it was feasible to, ele to, to create that change, I would be easily. fearful of gerrymandering and so on, as long as, so we don't have to import uh, uh, problems that we don't have. Uh, and, and therefore, again, ideally it's, a, it, it's, it's not a bad idea, but it's far from implementation. And we gave some of the indications why. Mm -hmm. I feel like we could have a whole other hour just to try to dive into that, that question a bit. With the two minutes that we have left, I wanted to just um, open it up to you three to, to give some closing remarks and thoughts um, as we conclude our hour together. So whoever would like to start, please um, start us off. Thank you. Ladies first. <laughs> So uh, the whole uh, issue here is to really uh, trying to fix the Israeli political system. Uh, the, our, uh, our incentive is to make good uh, suggestions and, to, and, yeah, and hope that uh, somebody up there will uh, listen and try to implement it. Um, I just can hope that uh, it will happen fast, that they will gain some stability in the next uh, Knesset. And uh, we are ready to work hard to convince uh, the, the, the leadership and Knesset members to, uh, um, to take our uh, recommendations and to implement them because it's really good recommendations. Thank you. I want to maybe highlight the fact, the important fact that like previous proposals of the IDI, this proposal is, is based on a comprehensive, comparative data and research and would make Israel much more similar to other parliamentary democracies. And it remains within the, the, the limits, the borders of the parliamentary regime. We do not propose to, to adopt presidential uh, regime or fixed terms without any flexibility. We, we, we want to preserve and to improve the current parliamentary regime in Israel. So Tamar, Israel is heading uh, towards an extremely consequential uh, election. It, it almost sounds like a, key, like a cliche because it's a fifth election, but nevertheless, it's extremely consequential for, for the Jewish state. This uh, prolonged crisis is emphasizing two structural uh, weaknesses. One, the fact that we don't have a constitution and there are serious risks associated with that. Number two, the 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 weak the features of the electoral system and we think there are some small remedies and 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 that potentially we can build consensus around them and it's extremely urgent that we rather than deteriorating that we will fix those elements because we see that the Israeli public is increasingly losing its faith and confidence in the system and it and in its ability uh, uh, to deliver the public goods. And this is why we are not planning to uh, uh, rest and not planning to uh, seize our efforts uh, uh, to introduce those changes. And thank you, Tamar, uh, uh, for initiating this discussion. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you all so much for participating. And thank you to all of our, our panelists. And I really continue to appreciate our our partnership, JFN's partnership with IDI, and I look forward to future programs together. And everybody on the line, you will get emails from us about one that's going to come up in December. We try to do these quarterly at least to keep to 
to leverage the expertise of the IDI to help inform our JFN network and members um, of, uh, and keep everybody informed of what's going on. So thank you so much. And we look forward to learning again soon. Have a great day, everybody.